politicians in the U.S. seem to be softening their stance on cryptos. Take a listen to the speech that Donald Trump made recently about how he now supports cryptos and opposes Elizabeth Warren. Take a listen. And I will also stop Joe Biden's crusade to crush crypto. We're going to stop it. I will ensure that the future of crypto and the future of Bitcoin will be made in the USA, not driven overseas. I will support the right to self-custody to the nation's 50 million crypto holders. I say this with your vote. I will keep Elizabeth Warren and her goons away from your Bitcoin. And I will never allow the creation of a central bank digital currency. This, of course, is a 180 shift in how he felt just a few years ago. So why the shift in sentiment and attitude now? And how will the Democrats respond to this uh, right before the elections in November? We're talking about this issue and the impact on the markets of the newly approved ETH ETFs with our next guest, James Seyfert. He is the research analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. This episode is sponsored by Itrus Capital, an IRA that offers 35 crypto assets in the lowest trading fees in the crypto IRA space at 1%. If you're looking for an IRA to park your Bitcoin and crypto returns with Bitcoin reaching new all-time highs uh, this year, you might want to look into iTrust Capital. Link below itrust.capital slash David or scan the QR code here if you're over 18 and you'd like to open a new account with cash or roll over roll over an existing account, click on the link down below and get started using my referral link. You'll get a hundred dollars in signing bonuses. James, welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. You've been uh, very active on Twitter. So I encourage everyone to check out <laughs> X and Twitter. Uh, James's feed, I'll put the link down below. You've got some great updates and I wanted to talk about some of these updates with you, starting with what seems to me and some other people a shift in sentiment towards cryptocurrencies by the U.S. government. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, President or uh, well, former President Donald Trump made a speech saying that he would not support CBDCs. He would not support uh, Elizabeth Warren's anti-crypto army were his words, and he would make crypto investing, I'm paraphrasing here, more accessible to people in the United States. Just uh, on May 31st, uh, Bitcoin Magazine tweeted, and you retweeted this, um, a, a seemingly reversal of policy from the Biden administration now that would allow highly regulated financial firms to custody Bitcoin and crypto. Let's start by talking about that piece of news first. What's going on? Yeah, so um, that's the SAB 121 vote, and that's just Staff Accounting Bulletin 121 from the SEC. And and basically what it does is it makes it functionally impossible for any regulated bank institution to custody any digital assets. It basically says, usually when you custody somebody's asset, you hold it in a vault or in a trust or usually it's stocks, bonds, what have you, right? Um, and that is not considered your assets. You charge a fee to hold that safely for them. Um, in the case of this SAB 121, they're basically saying that any assets held, uh, specifically digital assets held by these banks, have to be used up as you, you need collateral for them um, in your rules. So it, it messes up all your regulatory ratios and all these things. You have to have certain liquidity ratios and solvency ratios. And all of a sudden, you need to hold it for every dollar in crypto you have, you need to hold some sort of reserve asset essentially against it. So functionally speaking, the cost of doing that and holding reserve asset against it is orders of magnitude higher than the fees they were charged to do it. So there's no other asset in the world that's really handled like this. So this is uh, a little ridiculous, uh, to be frank, right? So for, for the most part, there's been bipartisan approval to basically say that this thing needs to be repealed. Um, it's taking our most regulated and um, safest, really, institutions from entering this space and forcing people to use things that aren't as safe or regulatory or, or no taken care of on a regulatory basis. So. Um, we had the House and the Senate both vote to that this needs to be repealed and the way that it was done was not correct. Um, and then we had Biden basically veto it. So we saw that there's been a bit of a 180 since we saw that the, the SEC was going to approve the spot, the spot Ethereum ETFs. Um, but this shows that it's not a complete 180. They're not fully relenting on things they're doing um, against the crypto space. That said, uh, Biden went out early in May 8th or May 9th, before the voting in the House even happened, and which was a week or two before um, the voting in the Senate happened, and said they were going to veto this. So it kind of wouldn't look great if they, uh, less than a month ago, said they were going to veto it and then come out and it hits his desk and he actually doesn't. So there's there's a lot of nuance here. This letter says... Um... Uh, by the White House, by virtue of invoking the Congressional Review Act, this Republican-led resolution would inappropriately constrain the SEC's ability to set forth appropriate guardrails and address future issues. And it says this reversal of the considered judgment of SEC, 
SEC staff in this way risks undercutting the SEC's broader authorities regarding accounting practices. My administration will not support measures that jeopardize the well-being of consumers and investors. What what guardrails is he referring to? I don't even. It's word salad as far as I'm concerned. He, I mean, I think he's trying to basically guardrail the, uh, basically um, cordon off the traditional financial markets. He doesn't want them to be infected by the risks of the the, the crypto markets, which, like, from a high level, kind of makes sense. But the way that they're going about doing it, this with this rule, um, in my opinion, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, it seems to be more political in nature um, than anything. What is your take or response to uh, the speech that Donald Trump made, I think, two weeks back now as of today? Uh, the right to Bitcoin self-custody, uh, he would not allow CBDCs. And like I mentioned at the beginning, he's, he, he is not supportive of, quote unquote, Elizabeth Warren's anti-crypto army. Now, this is a reversal of his previous stance on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, I believe, a couple of years ago. He did not see things the way, at least what he's saying now. Is this... Is he just trying to? Is this just a political game he's playing, or is there a broader shift in sentiment? Yeah, I think there's there's a few things here. I, th- I think actually the word he used was goons, Elizabeth Warren's goons. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I think you're right. I didn't want to go there, but yeah, 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 yeah. more appropriate yeah, yeah, direct yeah. quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you got to throw in the the his his uh, his way of saying things, I guess. But um, I mean, to be very clear, he's it, this is obviously at least the very least somewhat transactional. Um, But it's become an election issue. And I mean, part of the reason why he saw the opening here um, is because of what Biden and Elizabeth Warren have done on the side of the government going after crypto. Um, So people who are single issue voters on this topic are basically now going to be funneling over uh, to Trump. And there's tens of millions of Americans that have exposure to digital assets. Um, And obviously, this has now become an election issue, um, whether they like it or not. And um, yeah, I mean, that's just that's just the matter of the fact of what's happening. And he did pivot a little bit. I mean, Mnuchin wasn't a huge fan of the space, which was Treasury Secretary at the time. He didn't really like it that much, but he's kind of come around. And part of it, I think, has to do with there's other people so that are in his orbit now that are talking up the benefits and virtues of, of things like Bitcoin specifically. So, um, I mean, I, I think this is rather transactional. Um, but at the very least, if you're a single issue voter um, and it's on this topic, I mean, it's it's kind of... There's no real argument here for the other way. If the Federal Reserve really wants to go ahead with a Fed coin, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if it's constitutional to ban a CBDC or stop them from doing that. I mean, we we do have something called central bank independence there, but I don't know if they need congressional approval as well. Do you know how that works? Because he's talking about banning CBDCs, right? Yeah. yeah. So there are bills in Congress already like submitted to try and do that. Um, I don't think they have any legs. I'm not a policy expert or a lawyer, sure. um, but that there's already bills that have been submitted in Congress to prevent that from happening. And he's basically just promising it won't happen under his watch and he'll probably it's, it's possible that we could get something out of Congress that basically stops the, the Fed from being able to, to launch uh, a CBDC. What is the broader, I guess, um, implication of banning a CBDC? What, what, who is he trying to appeal to right now? People who don't want oversight, because basically what you can do is you can control everything that people are doing with, with money once you once you have that, right? It's basically programmable money, um, and you can dictate who gets what, how much, uh, where they spend it, what they spend it on, um, things like that. So that's what the overarching concern is, I guess. Um, but yeah, they, they people just they want a separation of, of money and state in some way, and they want some financial privacy. Is is the real argument against uh, CBDC? It, 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 it makes sense to be quite frank, because you once you have everything on a ledger and it's complete, and you can determine where it's spent and how it's spent. It's a you, you could see how that could easily. Obviously, some parts of that might make some sense, but uh, you could see how that can that type of power can be uh, abused by a government. Do you think the government, instead of a CBDC or a Fed coin, could adopt, let's say, just a, a USDC, for example, or some sort of stable coin? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, then we're getting into the topic of like banks and and Fed charters and things like that. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, the one area of of um, digital assets that has definitively, without argument, in my opinion, found product market fit is stablecoin. There's a few other areas that I don't necessarily agree with, uh, NFTs and different things. Digital store value is what Bitcoin is for the most part. There's decentralized applications all over Ethereum and Solana, but like for the most part in the real world, um, I think there's going to be plenty of use cases for these this type of technology technology and these assets, but stable coins is one of them where we, we there it's I don't even think it's arguable to say that there isn't product market fit there. It's basically a new euro dollar market and people in other countries specifically that want the stability of the dollar, it's the easiest way to get it right now. Um, and I think the 
personally, like the U.S., it just makes sense for the U.S. government to support and put regulations and guardrails around that. Um, so I think we could see a stablecoin bill in Congress this year. And so does my policy analyst down in D.C., Nathan Dean. Um, so that would make more sense just because it would basically promote the strength of the U.S. dollar and spread it further around the world. Well, it's a few months until the election. How do you think the Democrats are going to respond to Trump's speech regarding cryptocurrencies right now? Presumably they have to do something to respond or they risk losing a few young votes to the Republicans. Yeah, I mean – They've already done it in, in ways from from there's a lot of stories out there about the the admin reaching out to different people in the space to talk about how they can court new, uh, voters on on the front of digital assets. Um, and they're also we saw them pivot on the Ethereum ETF. Um, they approved that after it was pretty much accepted by everyone involved, all the lawyers, all the issuers I'm speaking to. Um, we had very low odds of approval, and there was a complete pivot right after the Senate voted on SAB 121 to approve it. Um, and Chuck Schumer was one of those Senate Dems that went across party lines and joined the Republicans. Um, and he's the <laughs> Senate Majority Leader, arguably the second most powerful Democrat in the country. So for that to happen tells you that there's there's changes happening within the Democratic Party. Um, just how much is is somewhat unknown now. We we don't know exactly what caused that pivot on the Ethereum ETF. It's it's like the the general consensus right now that it's something in the Biden admin, but that's not guaranteed. It could have been something else um, with the way that the commission works. I don't. We, we can go down that rabbit hole if if you'd like. What I'm curious as to how regulations around uh, cryptocurrencies and ex- particular exchanges would evolve. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, right now it kind of seems like we're in a relative stalemate. I mean, the the SEC is regulating via enforcement right now, and they have been for years. Um, there has been calls from within, namely the two Republican commissioners, to kind of change that and do more engagement and with rules um, on these different market players. Um, but the, I think depending on what happens with the election could dictate what actually happens going forward. So there's a lot of things in this space that um, trying to figure out what's going to happen going forward is going to be completely dictated by, or at least largely dictated by what happens in November. So our, our view overall is just that the Democratic Party, particularly certain people in swing states um, in the House and, and in the Senate, um, are relatively more pro this space. Um, they believe in this space. Um, and it often has to be tends to skew younger. Um, so this is not necessarily just divided down party lines. It's also divided by um, age in some regards. Um, so there's there's a whole bunch of ways to try and figure out like how this is going to go going forward. But right now, the SEC is still on its regulation via enforcement, but there has been a slight change, but not complete change. Like I said, they Biden still vetoed the repeal of SAB 121. Um, and we still haven't got these Ethereum ETFs approvals done and done yet, but for the, it's 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 bound to happen. Should be a matter of when, not if. So I think they are likely to be less uh, vehemently anti crypto and DeFi and digital assets, uh, but I don't think they're going to pivot to being the super pro digital asset side of things um, in the way that Trump is promising his administration will. Well, let's talk about this. Um... Well, this trend of ETF approvals. So ETH ETF approvals uh, came in uh, not too long ago. Did that take you by surprise at all? The fact that the SEC, uh, well, didn't reject it, which is, I guess, tacit consent. Yeah, I mean, that was very surprising to us. So our official odds were 25%. And I'll be quite frank, we were in the process of possibly updating our odds to lower and write a note that was going to lower our odds to 15% um, during the week when we started hearing chatter. So Eric Valchunas and I actually broke the news that approval was likely to happen. Um, and that only happened that Monday morning, um, late morning, from what I understand, early afternoon. Um, and the due date for the decision was that Thursday. So there was no time. Usually it takes weeks, many days to write up approval orders of what's called the 19 before. And that's basically the exchanges requesting the ability to, to launch these things. Um, if you talk to any issuer, um, and I've talked to many of them, including the the top dogs, Fidelity and BlackRock. None of them were expecting approvals. They all were expecting denials. I had meetings on like prep calls for different panels I've been on, um, and all the prep calls we talked about. Uh, one, we're expecting a denial, and then two on the panels we actually said that, and then two, we had we I had conferences planned where we were like podcasts and space, Twitter spaces and things where we were like, let's talk about the denial on this time. So like everyone was expecting a denial. Um, so what happened? What, what was the pivot change? The first theory was one, this was that I don't really have, I don't think is correct. They, the SEC planned to do this all along um, and they were likely going to approve because they were backed into a corner in the same way they were on Bitcoin. 
I don't think that's the case. The SEC was not engaging with anyone. There was no interaction. They were not basically giving any feedback whatsoever on these filings. I don't think that was going to happen. The second option is the Biden admin or some people higher up in the Democratic Party um, basically called in um, after the Senate majority, after the Senate vote uh, to repeal SAB in 21, after Trump made this an election issue and basically stopped the SEC from denying these Ethereum ETFs. Um, and the third option, which is a seeming possible as well, is that uh, the way that the SEC commission is works, the Securities Exchange Commission, the way it works is there's two Republicans, two Democrats, and then whoever's the president in power theoretically gets to select the chairman who runs the, 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 the commission. Uh, in this case, that's Gary Gensler. He's a, he's a Democrat. So theoretically, the three Democrats, if anything that they differ on on a political basis, the three Democrats have the power to override. Um, and what happened with the bus spot Bitcoin ETFs is, is Gensler is the one that had to be the swing vote there because the courts basically dictated the SEC had to approve. It's possible here that Gensler wasn't the swing vote. I mean, theoretically, it could be and that and that uh, the Biden admin came down and said, this is what we have to do or someone high in the Democratic Party. But also you have to realize the so Caroline Crenshaw is more with the on the Elizabeth Warren side of things. She's very anti the space. She actually dissented fully in the approval of the, the spot Bitcoin ETFs. The other Democratic commissioner, Liz Araga, spent a decade plus, I believe, at, or he spent a very long time working with Nancy Pelosi, who seems to have pivoted here and been more at least pro or open to crypto. So it's possible that he could have been that swing vote that that forced this through. The issue is we don't actually have a real vote. This this was uh, this approval order was issued via something called delegated authority, which basically is how most things happen at the SEC. Like the commissioners don't decide everything from the top down, right? For the most part, you're like, here's the SEC staff. You work in all these different divisions. You need to make the decisions. It's delegated authority, and. But for stuff like this, typically there is a vote. In this case, they went up via del delegated authority, so we don't see that vote breakdown. But something happened, as far as we're concerned, at the SEC in the week week prior to the ultimate approvals of these Ethereum ETFs um, that that caused things to change, and it had to have been political. And I don't know anyone else involved in this process around the SEC, um, around DC. Everyone is in agreement that this was a, a political change of tune. But we still there, there's still some time likely before we get the Ethereum ETFs actually launched and trading. Yeah. So just to uh, recap what you said. So on May 20th, you tweeted that you're upgrading your uh, chances for an ETF odds upping to 75 percent so i'm I, I actually spoke with your colleague Eric Bautunas as well about this issue last month i'm wondering why uh bluebrick intelligence assigned a lower probability before what were the assumptions you're making that led to your conclusion that ultimately it was going to be rejected and of course we explained why that didn't happen yeah so i mean it, the, the the main overarching thing was so if you look at our odds uh actually right after the spot eat bitcoin approval happened in in uh, early January, we were at 70, 75% odds of approval for the Ethereum ETF. So it just made sense. The, all the all the prerequisites are there. We have a, we have a CME futures market that's regulated by the CFTC. Um, we have futures ETFs. So Bitcoin futures and Ethereum futures ETFs have been approved at that time. It just made sense. And logically, and from our own personal views, we thought they should be approved. It made more sense. The ETF wrapper can pretty much handle anything and made complete sense that, the, that Ethereum would be next because all the prerequisites are there. But then we went for four months and not a single thing happened. Happened. There was no interaction between these issuers and the SEC. There was no, nothing was going on. There was a lot of issuers filing things that were not indicative of any interaction between the SEC. And we're talking to people in this process. And basically, they're telling us the SEC was stonewalling them, almost not blatantly saying it, but basically hinting that these are going to be denied, be ready for a denial. So everything was lined up until that week before the ultimate approval that these were going to be denied. Um, so if we, I'll, get, I'll take a step back for the spot Bitcoin ETFs, we saw a bunch of interactions starting in early October. That's when Eric and I went to 90% approval odds for spot Bitcoin ETFs. That was a complete change of process that doesn't normally happen. And then we had three months of interactions, of meetings with the SEC, filings, updates, all these different things going on. They were indicating to us every step along the way that it was becoming more and more likely that these spot Bitcoin ETFs were going to launch. The exact opposite was happening with Ethereum. There was nothing happening that was indicating to us that these things were going to be approved, despite the fact we thought the right decision would have been to approve them. Um, and that all changed. Obviously, we have some phone calls on on a Monday morning and early afternoon to um, these issuers that were trying to launch these ETFs. Are there differences from a regulatory perspective from approving a Bitcoin ETF versus an ETH ETF? I know in the past that the SEC has categorized Bitcoin as a commodity and everything else not. So I'm not. I'm wondering if that has anything to do with this. Yeah, so 
the other part of this is in, in early May, we saw so in, in, and uh, in April, there was a lot of lawsuits and Wells notices coming out of the SEC in regard to Ethereum possibly being a security. Um, my overarching view was I'd never really truly thought the SEC was going to claim Ethereum to be a security. There'd be issues with the Ethereum ETFs, that, the futures ETFs that they had launched and the CME futures markets by doing that. Um, my theory all along was that they have an issue with staking in Ethereum. So, so Ethereum is proof of stake. Uh, Bitcoin operates on proof of work. Um, and staking, you get like a yield for staking your Ethereum and, and validating the network and things like that. Um, I I think the SEC has a problem with that. We know that the SEC is these whatever happens with these ETFs, whenever they launch, whenever the next step of the process is completed, they are not going to have staking allowed. No one is allowed to stake the ETF involved in the ETH involved in these ETFs. Um, so that said. This approval puts that to rest, this argument that Ethereum is security. As far as the SEC is concerned, these ETFs are approved as commodities-based trust shares to list on the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the CBOE, um, which means Ethereum is, is, is a commodity. Ethereum, the asset, the token, whatever you want to call it, is a commodity. That said, I have a feeling the SEC is not done with their war on the space. Um, and I think they're going to try to claim that staked ETH specifically or staking as a service and those things. We've seen it in different lawsuits with Coinbase and Kraken. Um, they think that's a security, um, which has a little more oomph behind it, I guess, in, in my personal opinion. I didn't think really, in my personal view, Ethereum didn't make sense to me be classified as security itself. So when uh, or uh, who exactly are we expecting to launch ETH ETFs? Yeah, so it's it's largely the same group of issuers that launched the spot Bitcoin ETFs minus a couple. So uh, you have Vanek, Arc, Grayscale, Invesco is partnered with Galaxy again, Fidelity, iShares, which is BlackRock, um, Franklin Templeton, and Bitwise. Um, so notably, um, Wisdom Tree, um, Valkyrie, which was bought by CoinShares, which is a large issuer of of these crypto ETPs globally, um, and Hashdex are are who entered the spot Bitcoin ETF race are the ones that are not here. Um, one, it's probably has to do with the competition. It was brutal as we as we saw with with iShares and Fidelity at the top, but Ark and Bitwise have also done exceptionally well. They're, all of these ETFs that launched did pretty well actually, but um, that has to do with the fact that there's 14 billion dollars of net inflows into this Bitcoin ETF. So even if you're only getting a small slice of that, you, you you're doing Doing okay, right? Um, but these things aren't going to allow staking, so that's probably going to hinder demand slightly. Uh, and it just seems like they just didn't feel like uh, it was worth it to to enter the space, this competition with these behemoths who are also going to launch at the same time. You mentioned earlier that there are still a few hurdles that need to be passed before these launch. What needs to be done? Yeah, so to get one of these ETFs approved, there's um, there's two processes that need to happen. With the spot Bitcoin ETFs, for example, they happen concurrently. So the Division of Trading and Markets is the one that issued those 19 B4 approval orders. That's basically a rule change for the SEC the exchanges to list a given ETF, whether it's spot Bitcoin ETF or Ethereum ETF. There needs to be a rule change that says, I want to list this asset in an ETF, and the SEC has to grant it um, be, that because of the way that these trusts are structured. Uh, the second process is these S1s or prospectuses or offering documents, whatever you're used to thinking about in the financial world, with their S1s in this case, the, the division of corporate finance needs to sign off on everything. And those tend to be like north of 100 pages. All your risk disclosures, if you ever look at these documents, they're super long being like this risk, this risk, you could lose your money this way, This the, describing what the Ethereum blockchain is. Like all of these things have to be written out and the division of corporate finance needs to basically sign off and saying this is okay. Um, the benefit is there is some overlap here between spot Bitcoin, not a ton, not a, a, a whole lot, but there is some overlap between spot Bitcoin and spot Ethereum. We also have Ethereum futures ETFs that also went through this process with the division of corporate finance. So basically this process can take anywhere from like a month or two to like up to five months. We think it'll be closer to the month or two number, um, maybe early July, but we're really just guessing at this point. So last Friday was the first uh, we saw all these amendments come in. Basically, the SEC goes to these issuers and says, you need to change this, you need to change that, you need to take this out, you need to add this. And the lawyers at these different ETF issuers who are contracted to do this go through and go through that all long, tiring, boring, uh, really painful process to get these submitted. And usually there's a ra couple rounds back and forth where the SEC says, no, I don't like this, or the issuers might argue with the SEC on different topics. So it's, it's, it's usually a thing that goes back and forth, but it should happen over the next month, I would say. Next month. Okay. So that yeah. was my next question. Great. Uh, well, I uh, I know you get asked this a lot, but uh, do you have any insight as to what's next in terms of the uh, ETF approval <laughs> world? Uh, yeah, probably nothing. So my case okay. since uh, for a long time now, for well over a year, it was the first thing we'll get is Bitcoin. The second thing we'll get is Ethereum. And then there's a whole long 
gap between we get the next thing. Now, that said, we talked about before, the election could change that. There are a few things, but there's two hurdles for, for anything else. Um, the first hurdle is like, is it a security or is it a, is it a commodity, right? So that needs to be clearly defined. And that's not really defined for anything now except for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And there are a few others. You could argue that Doge and Litecoin and some other things are definitely commodities, but nothing else is really done. And even some of the ones that people throw out there, the SEC is actively arguing that they are securities, whether that's uh, you know Solana or uh, Ripple XRP, things like that. There's a lot of things that need to happen. But the, 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 the second step, aside from clarifying what the status is of that underlying asset, is you need a regulated market market. So for these ETFs, for, for Bitcoin and for Ethereum, these approval orders, they basically point to the CME futures markets. And that's regulated by the SEC sister agency, the CFTC, Commodities Futures and Trading Commission. And basically, they can surveil it. So that means the SEC can see what's going on and kind of look for fraud and manipulation. Uh, they they want to make sure there's fair orderly markets. That's what the division of trading and markets is all about. So without any sort of regulated market for these other assets, which there isn't right now, that's not to say that things can't change, that the maybe the, some of these uh, market structure bills going through Congress, like FIT21, um, unlikely to happen immediately. But over the next year or two, that could clarify a lot of these issues, bring in some more regulated markets, and then we can get an ETF. But as things stand, um, it's probably a long way out. And particularly because even if you do manage to get a futures market that's regulated by the CFTC, which is the current path we know works, you need some years of of trading and you you need to look at data and make sure that there's correlation there and you need to understand these things. Like it's not like, oh, you get a futures market and then all of a sudden you get an ETF. No, it's futures market and then we got futures ETFs a couple of years later and then we got the spot ETFs a year, a couple of years after that. So that's the current timeline. Um, I think that will be sped up for the next one potentially. But again, I think what happens in November could really uh, change some of this. What I would be interested in as an investor is potentially a an ETF product that is a basket of different currencies, right? Has there been any talk of that happening? Uh, presumably, a lot of regulation. That's not uh, going to happen in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, you ha you have it in Canada. Um, there right. are a few in Canada that are like that, and there's more coming. There's a bunch in in Europe that actually mm -hmm. do this. Um, they'll hold like ten different assets. Uh, in the U.S., we have some of those like grantor trust structures that do this, um, both from Grayscale and from Bitwise, that will hold a whole bunch of assets. But those have issues with just trading at huge discounts and premiums and things like that because they're not um, SEC approved to trade as ETFs. So um, I think I think it, I think it'll be very quick once we get these ETFs out the door. Somebody is there. There will be launches of. Uh, ETFs that hold both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, things like maybe one will be equal weighted and one will be market cap weighted, something like that. So that's likely to happen in the near future, I would say. Um, I'd be surprised if we don't see somebody file for that before the end of the year, um, but we'll see. I'm wondering whether or not these uh, these ETH ETFs that are going to be launched will change the demand supply fundamentals at all for ETH. We already know it's a deflationary asset. This is going to add more demand pressure. Uh, have you looked into this issue at all? Um, yeah. So, I mean, no matter what you do, like if you just look at the Bitcoin ETFs, I mean, people like to say, like, look what happened to Bitcoin ETFs and what's going to happen to ETH too. So I would take a step back. What happened with the Bitcoin ETFs is unprecedented, um, completely unprecedented. Uh, to give you an example, um, IBIT, which just passed Grayscale's BlackRock's IBIT just passed Grayscale's um, GBTC and assets. Um, that thing made it to 10 billion in like 49 trading days, which is a few months. Um, the previous record to 10 billion was uh, an ETF that did it in like over 600 trading days, which it, it was like three years, three plus years, right? So, which ETF was that? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> I don't remember off the top of my head. That's okay. I, I, we, I did it a couple of months ago, but I do remember the numbers. It was over three years. Wow. And so we're, we're only five months in and IBIT just crossed the $20 billion mark. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the rate at which these things are growing and then FBTC was one of the fastest $2 billion too from Fidelity. Right. All these funds are doing exceptionally well, right? So even if you get a fraction of the interest and demand that the Bitcoin ETF saw into the Ethereum ETFs, they will be successful ETF launches because, I mean... It, it, no matter how you slice it, it's 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 going to look good. So the question is like, how much demand do we see? And like um, Eric wrote a piece recently, he thinks fifteen to twenty percent of the the flows that went to the Bitcoin ETFs, we could see that same sort of demand for 
Uh, the Ethereum ETFs, I'm probably a little higher, like 20 to 25 percent as our guess based on what we're seeing out there. Um, but there's no way really to know. Is, is there going to be some rotation out of like, okay, I have a 4 percent exposure to Bitcoin. I'm going to take some of that and put it to Ethereum. I don't think so. I think that's going to be the minority. Um, so it's, it's, it's also the part of the other problem here is like, I'm sure you know this, like if you talk to people, people hear crypto and like Bitcoin is the first thing they think of. Like they don't know much about anything else. And, and it's just yeah. easier to talk about a digital gold, digital store of value, mm-hmm. things like that. It's just way easier to have a conversation about that than Ethereum. That said, we'll see over time as people learn more about the space, what, what that actually does to the demand picture for these, these ETFs that are coming at some point in the next month or, or more. Final question, I'll let you go. The Grayscale uh, GBTC was well, had a history of trading at huge premiums and discounts depending on the day. Um, presumably, that's not going to happen with these ETFs because of the creation redemption process, right? Correct. Yeah. So ETH collapsed its discount after, uh, actually, after we broke the news that the the SEC had completely pivoted on its its uh, yeah. its view of the Ethereum ETFs, and that discount went from twenty one percent on that Friday before we put we we issued that news on Monday, and by the close on Monday it was like it was something like four or five percent, and now it's even tighter. So, what happens is people are just basically in there um, waiting for the ETF to happen. Um, and we'll see what happens over there. But the the actual, um, like you said, the creation redemption process, you can exchange the underlying asset for shares of the ETF. And that always means that once this thing becomes an ETF, after things are kind of arped out, like if we looked at GBTC's conversion, it still had a slight discount uh, for like a couple of days, actually. It took time for the market makers to really unwind all of that and really uh, get things tighter and in line. Um, but that's the same thing that we expect to happen with ETH. So the other problem here is like trying to figure out how much money is going to come out of ETH and what percentage of that money coming out of ETH from Grayscale is going to go into these other products. For Grayscale, it was a good chunk of the money that left went into these other products. But there was also a lot of money, institutional capital, bankruptcies that were tied up in there that um, essentially ju- just took the money out and didn't go anywhere. But there was a lot of new demand. I mean, we're at $14 billion in new flows. We're not even five months in for um, these, these spot Bitcoin ETFs here in the US, uh, which is, like I said, it's it's pretty much unprecedented. James, excellent overview. Thanks very much for being on the show. I, I you know, I'm going to have you on again to give uh, more updates as things develop. Uh, where can we follow you? I mentioned you have a Twitter handle, so we'll put that. But anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, if anyone's, uh, you, for anyone out there who's a terminal client, that's where all of our really deep dives and, and true research is, is put there. So um, we tease out some stuff and we interact with people pretty actively on Twitter. Uh, so I'm J-S-E-Y-F-F. But for the most part, the real place to get to, to me and my colleague, Eric Valchunas, is, is going to be on the Bloomberg Terminal. All right. Get yourself a Bloomberg Terminal, guys. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, David. Next time. Yeah, next time. And uh, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.